Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nancy Smith, and I'm the Executive Director of the Western New York Land Conservancy. Thank you all very much for joining us tonight for this special presentation. No, it's not working? That, is it working? Yes, it's working, sorry. <laughs> Thank you all very much for joining us tonight for this special presentation by Doug Tallamy. Doug is a spokesperson for so many things that I love. Good evening. His core Good message. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nancy Smith and I'm the executive. Hmm. Go ahead, Nancy. Okay. His core message is that every person matters. And with our actions, each one of us, every day, every minute really makes a difference. There couldn't be a more important message in today's world. I grew up spending summers on a biology field station surrounded by students and teachers who were passionate about butterflies, warblers, and salamanders. So Doug's message that the welfare of our smallest creatures and the health of our interrelated natural communities really matters, that's a message that resonates deeply with me. Doug has been one of my heroes ever since I discovered his first book, Bringing Nature Home. As I devoured his most recent book, nature's best hope, I realized that there was yet another reason why his message rings true for me. My grandma and grandpa's home on the shores of Great East Lake in Maine is just like the natural oasis that Doug challenges all of us to create in our yards. There was no great lawn surrounding their home, only paths between gardens. Each inch of their land was a patch of blueberry bushes, cascading flowers, mixed in with shrubs and pine trees. It was a home for butterflies, hummingbirds, and more than a few chipmunks. It was a magic kingdom for a young child as well as for wildlife. Doug speaks the language of plants and animals with a message of how each one of us can sustain mother nature. I invite you to listen deeply to the stories and the science, to the wisdom and the urgency. Please find a place for this in your heart and in your yard. Just a few logistics. Um, Doug's presentation is going to run about an hour in length, and then it'll be followed by about 20 minutes for questions and answers. If you have a burning question that we don't ask, please email it to us at info at wnylc.org. I'd like to thank the University at Buffalo for their IT support and Lynn Camara for sponsoring tonight's presentation. Lynn is a dear friend, a native plant enthusiast, and a garden consultant with her business Lessons from Nature. And now it is my great honor to introduce Doug Tallamy. Thank you very much, Nancy. I'm going to screen share. Uh, host has disabled my ability to screen share. Gotta let me screen share. There we go. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right, then we'll start this. Okay. Um, I would like to talk about my ideas of what nature's best hope is these days. But before we do that, let's talk about acorns. Do you remember last fall? Uh, it was what we call a mast year, uh, particularly with the red oak group. All the red oaks from, uh, well, certainly upper New York State, all the way down to Georgia, all the way west to the Mississippi, they got together and they decided uh, that is when they would make their, their acorns last fall. They did. They made a lot of them. Uh, and if you were easily entertained like I am, maybe you took one of those acorns and just stared at it. And if you were lucky, you might have seen this happen. A little blemish occur on the side of the acorn and it moved. And it's pretty obvious that something's chewing its way out of that acorn. It doesn't take long. It wriggles and puffs. It doesn't seem possible it could squeeze through that little hole. Looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Um, well, it's a larva. It's an insect larva and it, it falls out of the, the acorn. This is a very dangerous time for this larva because uh, it is full of protein, full of fat, and everything wants to eat it. So it's got to get below ground. So it continues to wiggle and it doesn't take that long either. About 30 seconds, it will wiggle its way down underground where it stays for two years. It forms a little pupa and it sits under there for two years. After two years, it comes out as an acorn weevil. 
Uh, now, a lot of people think uh, weevils have a big nose, certainly looks that way, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here. And what they use, use, do with those mouth parts is to chew a hole down into the center of the acorn. If it's a female, she turns around, lays an egg, and that's how the larva gets down into the center of the acorn where it is safe, develops pretty quickly, and the process repeats itself. You might wonder why they spend two years underground. Well, it takes red oak acorns two years to develop. So you don't want to come out before your, your host is ready. Well, of course, after the acorn weevil leaves, there's a hole in the acorn. Uh, and, and you've all heard that nature abhors a vacuum. That's going to be used. And it turns out there are uh, specialized ants that love to live inside the holes uh, left by acorn weevils in acorns. They're in the genus Temnothorax, a couple of species. Uh, so if they discover a hole, they get very excited. The first thing they do is go back and recruit uh, everybody from, they're probably in a dilapidated acorn at this point, and they move their larvae. They work very hard. It's a frenetic time. Doesn't take long, maybe 30 minutes, and they've moved the entire colony inside their new acorn. They post a little guard here, make sure nobody else comes, but they will stay in that acorn again for about two years till it falls apart. About this time, my, my wife says, what is your point here? What does this have to do with your talk? My point is, this is a specialized relationship, and it's one that occurs right in our yards. It occurs in my yard, but I'll bet it occurs in your yard as well. And that's my point. Nature is built from these types of specialized relationships, millions of them. You won't have pileated woodpeckers if you don't have lots of carpenter ants because that's what they feed their young. And you won't have lots of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that support carpenter ants. You won't have 13 species of native bees if you don't have the pollen of sunflowers. Uh, typically the perennial sunflowers, not the, the giant ones we've, we've changed for bird seed, uh, but that is the only pollen that these bees can, can rear their young on. You won't have platycotus tree harpers unless you have, have oaks. Uh, so again, nature is a series of specialized relationships, but today these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we have not taken Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy got wind of the fact that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the Grand Canyon, he stood on the edge and he looked out over its magnificent magnificence and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, uh, it, that was the beginning of the creation of the Grand Canyon National Park. Good idea. Leave it as it is. The problem is today, of course, is that um, there's very little places, a few places we can leave as, as they are. Only about 5% of the lower 48 states is, is anything close to its original pristine um, condition. And those areas are typically uh, the tops of mountains, very rugged areas where humans can't, can't go. And that, of course, is because we have logged it. We've logged most areas of the country numerous times. Uh, we've tilled it. We've drained it. We've grazed it. We've paved it or otherwise developed it. We've straightened our rivers and we've dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our, our uh, skies. We've changed our atmosphere, our climate for, for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of non-native plants that are now aggressively changing native plant communities throughout the country. In short, we have, have carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species that we need them to sustain, those species that run the ecosystems that support us. We've done all that because we had this idea that our nest, planet Earth, was so big, we could foul it forever and, and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were, we were wrong. And now we're seeing the results. Uh, every time we look at the headlines, we see um, what's, what those consequences are. Like the insect apocalypse is here. Insects are disappearing globally. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? We have lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. Not 3 billion species, but 3 billion birds. And let me remind you what a billion is. Uh, a million seconds is 12 days. A billion seconds is 31.7 years. So a billion birds, that's a lot of birds that aren't here anymore. The UN says uh, we may lose a million species, uh, possibly in the next 20 years to extinction, gone forever. And humans will suffer as, as a result. Uh, well, I could go on with um, 
talking about the pox that we have delivered uh, upon our environment and thus upon all of our houses. Uh, but this is not, not a talk about that pox, it's a talk about a cure for that pox. Small efforts from a lot of people are gonna deliver enormous physical, psychological and environmental benefits to all people. Let's return to, to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Uh, well, E.O. Wilson told us what it means for the rest of life on earth. He's been, he's been thinking about this uh, for decades and way back in 1987, he wrote this paper, The Little Things That Run the World, The Importance of Conserving in, Invertebrates. Uh, and most of those invertebrates are, are insects. And in that paper, he had one simple message, life as we know it depends on insects. If they were to, to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And that would change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems uh, to the point where the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals would collapse and they would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the, the planet would, would rot because we'd lose insect decomposers that today rapidly turn over nutrients. And of course, humans would not, not survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is that um, this doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself. But to do that, we're gonna have to change the way we landscape. Why do we have to do this? Well, we humans are totally dependent on nature. We are totally dependent on what we call ecosystem services. What does nature give us? Here are just some of the services that, that plants produce for us. Of course, they, they produce oxygen. I think we all still need that. Um, they clean water and slow its journey to the sea. Once it's in the sea, it's too salty. We can't use it then. They capture carbon. This is an enormously important uh, ecosystem service today. They're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, putting it in their tissues, and, and equally important, they pump it into the soil. The soil is dark brown or even black because of the carbon that plants have pumped into it. Speaking of soil, they build the topsoil, they hold it in place. If we didn't have any plants, uh, the earth would be a rocky, rocky surface. All the soil would be in the ocean. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, just some of the things that plants do for us. What do animals do? Well, they provide pest control services for those plants. They pollinate nearly 90% of those plants. They disperse the seeds of those plants. And of course, they, they are the meat and potatoes of the food webs that uh, support the, the animal life that runs our ecosystems. So designing landscapes that, that destroy these types of ecosystem services is simply no longer an option. There's not enough untouched places where we can afford to do that any longer. Now, through the years, there have been, been uh, visionaries who recognize that our relationship with nature is not a sustainable one. And, and one of the most prominent, of course, was Aldo Leopold. He wrote Sand County Almanac. He's considered the, the father of modern conservation. Uh, he said uh, uh, many wonderful things, but, but one of the things he, he said was the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. And we humans have not been very good at, at that. Um, we vary in, in culture. Some cultures are better at it than others, but um, our, our, our European capitalistic culture is particularly bad at it. Uh, we, we tend to draw, destroy areas, move to another area, destroy that. Uh, and you know, when we had small populations, that worked because while we were off destroying one place, uh, the place we previously had destroyed would recover and we can go back and, and, and do this for a long time. Uh, can't do that today. We've got 7.8 billion people on the planet expanding every day. There is no place else to go. Uh, so we're simply gonna have to stop spoiling the resources that support us. Well, Aldo had a, had a dream about how we might do that. He said, we need to develop what he called a land ethic. Yes, we have to use the land. We have to farm it and lumber it and graze it and mine it and hunt on it. But we have to learn to do those things without destroying local ecosystems. Uh, and that's what he dreamt of, that, that we as a culture would develop a, a functional land ethic. What has always uh, puzzled me though, is that he never talked about developing a land ethic where we actually lived. It was always someplace else where we were using the land. Uh, and I'm not sure why that was. It could be that the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in our culture that, that he didn't recognize it as an option at all. 
Well, living with nature is an option. I'm going to, that's, that's my main message tonight. And in fact, I believe it's the only option that's left to us. We have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes. How are we going to do that? Well, where should we start? Um, there are lots of places we can start, but we cannot ignore privately owned land. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. If we ignored those areas, we'd only be working with 15% of the land. And again, that would result in, in conservation areas that are too small and too isolated from each other to do their job. So private property is going to be part of the future. Uh, but there's a lot of areas we haven't thought of as possible uh, conservation centers. And it adds up to a lot of acres, like power and pipeline rights of ways. There's 21 million acres in, in power line rights of ways. How about golf courses? How about airports? The, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. How about all the places we live in, in rural residential areas, suburbia, exurbia, even urban centers? They all could be targets for conservation. Roadsides, we have 4 million miles of paved roads. Each of them have two sides. Uh, that's a lot of a lot of potential uh, area for conservation, railroad rights of ways. If you simply add up all of that acreage, that's 599 million acres that right now are not being focused on for conservation. How big is 599 million acres? Well, it's the size of Vermont plus New Jersey plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, plus Texas all added up together. So not having a place to do conservation. And notice I didn't touch, I didn't touch farming areas. These are areas outside of the, the places we are farming. So not having an area to, to do this is, is not our problem. What we want to do on these sites is to restore nature. And we have to restore all parts of nature. But all parts of nature are not equally important. There are, there are building blocks of nature. There are species upon which other species uh, depend totally. So let's start with those, those really important species, the ones that contribute the most to ecosystem function. And when we're talking about building food webs that support all the rest of the animals, it turns out the caterpillars are essential. Why? Because they, more than any other type of animal, are transferring energy from plants. Remember, plants are capturing energy from the sun, turning it into food. And then they pass it, caterpillars are passing that energy on to other, um, other animals, more than any other type of a plant eater. So plants, uh, uh, caterpillars turn out to be enormously important. Chickadees, for example, are rearing, rearing their young. Um, actually, the chickadees in my yard have started. They have started to feed their babies. Uh, and they're going to feed them almost exclusively on caterpillars. Uh, and it turns out that chickadees are not exceptions. Most birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. And we actually have data now to support that, that uh, contention. This is, these are the results of a citizen science project that Ashley Kennedy, my recent PhD student, um, completed. What she did was have people take pictures of birds while they were uh, nesting. And the pictures were good enough that we could see what they were bringing back to the nest. So what you're looking at are 16 or, or 20 families of, of birds, 20 common families of birds. And the green bars are the percentage of the nestling diet that is caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 families pictured here, caterpillars dominate the nestling diet. So imagine what would happen to all of those bird species if caterpillars disappeared from our, our landscapes. So caterpillars are important, but why? What is special about caterpillars? Well, it turns out there are a number of things that are special. One of them is that they are rel relatively soft prey items. I like to think of this guy as a, a sausage with a very thin wrapper. Uh, thin wrapper is important. That's the exoskeleton, the cuticle, uh, and it is undigestible. So you don't want a lot of that when you're, when you're feeding their young. Uh, and because it's soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your, your baby without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent feed their, their young, they're pretty rough. It's kind of like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Uh, caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. So some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein. Uh, they have a low percentage of chitin of exoskeleton compared to other insect groups, particularly beetles, which are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks, and they've got lots of, of sharp edges. 
And it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breezing season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because uh, I love organic chemistry, um, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and vertebrates can't make carotenoids, yet they are essential components of our diets. We have to get them from plants. And that's why my wife, Cindy, says I, I have to eat my, my carrots to get my beta carotene and my, my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my, my lutein. She makes sure I, I eat all that stuff because it stimulates my immune system. I am simply healthier when I've had access to lots of carotenoids. Uh, and, and believe me, today, uh, this day and age, having a healthy immune system is a good thing. They are antioxidants. They run around our bodies and, and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality. They, they improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're largely talking about male birds like this prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines and he's taken those lutines and built pigments out of them and put them in his feathers. And then the brighter he is, the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he will attract. So birds are getting their carotenoids from their prey. And here's the important point. Carotenoids are not evenly distributed across bird prey items. These first two bars, this is the total carotenoid content of two types of caterpillars, far more than other types of, of insects and, and other invertebrates. The third bar is uh, crickets and orthopterans, uh, grasshoppers, very high in carotenoids. Here are adult uh, caterpillars over here, the butterflies and the moths, much lower because of course uh, butterflies and moths are not eating the green leaves. It's the caterpillars that eat the green leaves. Here's the earthworm way down here. The early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does this matter when birds are out foraging? Well, it appears to. What Ashley also did was, was put GoPro cameras on the roof of bird, uh, bluebird houses. And those cameras took a picture once a second and what it did was was grab the or capture the the uh, birds as they flew into the box to feed their young. The pictures were good enough that we could identify what was in the beak of of the bluebirds. So she had a lot of bluebird boxes and a lot of GoPro cameras, and it went on for three years. And she had over a million pictures to go through. But after she did this, these were the results. Uh, there was a very good correlation between the frequency with which a prey item was brought to the nest and the total carotenoid content. So caterpillars are brought in more than anything else, followed by those orthopteroids, the crickets and the grasshoppers. And then everybody else was nestled down here in the, in the uh, corner. So all this is to say that, that for birds, it appears that caterpillars are not optional parts of the diet. It's really starting to look like they are essential parts of the diet. Uh, and if they're essential to breeding birds, uh, you're not gonna have breeding birds unless you have enough caterpillars. So that's the next question. How many caterpillars does it take to support a, a, a population of breeding birds? So for example, how many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? It takes a lot, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars just to get them to the point where they leave the nest. Uh, and then the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 24 days after they leave the nest. Um, that's a lot of caterpillars for a bird that's only a, a third of an ounce. So if we want breeding birds in our landscapes, and we do, because there is no other place for them to be, how do we make landscapes that create a lot of caterpillars? This is a new goal for landscaping. I don't think we've focused on that in the past. Well, we add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that make those, those caterpillars. And unfortunately, there's a catch to that. All plants don't make caterpillars equally because most caterpillars are really fussy about which plants they can eat. We call them host plant specialists and they can only eat particular plants with which they have co-evolved. So we have to add the plants that have a lot of caterpillar specialists. Why are insect herbivores, why are all these caterpillars host plant specialists? Because plants don't want to share their energy. They, they want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they, they've loaded their, their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why when we look outside, uh, it's green. 
or I don't know where you are, but it will be shortly. Uh, not because there are no insects out there that, that want to eat those plants, but because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of those plants. They are too well protected chemically. But insects do eat plants. Uh, so how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Most insects, and we're talking about 90% of them, can only eat the plants with which they have, have developed particular adaptations to circumvent the, the plant defenses. So they develop enzymes and behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that allow them to eat those plants without dying. But uh, that takes a, a long period of evolutionary exposure to those plant lineages. It does not happen overnight. All I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. When we're trying to rebuild nature in all these areas we've taken it away, we have to choose the plants that are gonna be most productive. And I'm gonna give you some examples of how this works, uh, starting with, with my own house, our own house. Um, we live in Oxford, Pennsylvania on 10 acres. This is what it looked like uh, shortly before we moved in. The 10 acres had been mowed for hay. Uh, so uh, there are very few plants there. As a matter of fact, this area had been farmed for over 300 years, so um, the soil is exhausted. And I am actually sitting in this window right here tonight. Um, well, by the time we actually did move in, the mowing had stopped. And uh, you know what you mow when you mow hay in the in the east is a bunch of in, invasive plant roots, like autumn olive and multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet. And those things came roaring back like crazy. So here's my wife, Cindy, getting ready to clear out some, some uh, multiflora rose with oriental bittersweet growing on top of it. This is what the entire 10 acres looked like. And by the way, she did it. She did it by just picking at it a little bit here and there. A lot of people look at this and say, oh, can't be done. And she did it by Anne. There were no bulldozers, no, you know, we had loppers. Uh, what was she doing or what was I doing while Cindy was working so hard? Well, um, I was bringing in the plants we're going to replace uh, those, those invasive plants from China with. Um, and, I, and I chose the plants based on my hobby. I like to take pictures of caterpillars. So um, I said, well, what plant is going to bring in uh, the types of caterpillars I'm going to take pictures of, like the Canadian outlet. Canadian outlet, beautiful caterpillar, but it is a specialist. That's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. It's a specialist on meadow rue. Um, there weren't a meadow rue at our house. There was no meadow rue anywhere around us. I still don't know where any meadow rue is. Um, so I got some seeds from someplace else, planted them. They grew. And then I started what I thought would be a long, a long wait. Um, I didn't know how many years it would take for the Canadian outlet to find my meadow rue. Maybe they had to come all the way from Canada. So I didn't look at my meadow rue for about a month. Uh, then I went out and it was defoliated. The, the Canadian outlet had found it uh, in spades. And now I have a thriving colony of, of both meadow root and Canadian outlet. So that worked really well. Did the same thing with the goldenrod stowaway, a mis misnomer because it has nothing to do with goldenrod. This beautiful moth is a specialist on Biden's aristosa, ditch, ditch daisy. There was a, a good population of this in a power line about 15 miles away. So I got some seed, planted them at our house and it took a year for, for uh, the, the goldenrod stowaway to come, but now again, thriving population. So what I'm doing is, is building the, the plant lineages and then the moth lineages that follow by putting in these plants into our yard. I wanted hackberry emperor because it ought to be here. Uh, and it's a, not a fantastic looking butterfly, but, um, but I like it anyway. Uh, well, it's a, it's a specialist on Celtis, on, on uh, hackberry. We didn't have any hackberries, so I planted hackberry. We now have a thriving population, but that took well, three or four years for them to, to find it. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own, and along with it, the things that specialize on goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the goldenrod gall moth. Now this is one, the goldenrod flower moth, and it's, it's larvae that I've been waiting for. Um, they still haven't found my, my goldenrod. Um, so this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out. One of these years, the ketchup's going to come out and I will go outside and find that, that beautiful moth. In the meantime, we got the, the uh, tephritid fly that makes the goldenrod gall. So the swellings you see in your goldenrod stems all winter long, if you don't cut your goldenrod stems down in the fall. Uh, turns out they're a very important part of the winter uh, food, food web. 
because they contain the larvae of that fly. They spend the winter in, in their big juicy larva and the birds know that. Anything that's, that's high in fat and protein in the winter time is really uh, desirable for birds because that's what gets them through those very cold nights. So the chickadees will peck at that, so will the tip mice, so will the uh, downy woodpeckers. And in the spring, this is what most of them look like. Um, and this is why we don't have too many goldenrod uh, galls because the birds have eaten most of them over the winter. I planted Virginia creeper. A lot of people don't like Virginia creeper, but it's a beautiful plant. Just don't put it on your house uh, because I wanted this. I, I, and I actually did put it on my house, put it on my back porch, but I wanted uh, this. I want to take that picture. That's that's the uh, Pandora Sphinx caterpillar. And that's what the beautiful adult looks like. Uh, and they came right away first year. That was very successful. But I got a lot of things I didn't expect. I got the lettered Sphinx. I got the hog Sphinx. I'm still waiting for the Abbott Sphinx. Um, and more anticipation, um, and it will it will happen. Wanted zebra swallowtails, because I think it's the prettiest of our, our swallowtails, but they are a specialist on pawpaw. That's what their caterpillar looks like. So we planted pawpaws uh, and actually had to wait nine years for those, those uh, swallowtails to find us because there's no population near us. The nearest one, excuse me, is about 26 miles away. But they finally found us. We now have a thriving population. In the meantime, the pawpaw sphinx came. I didn't even know there was a pawpaw sphinx. Um, and we got lots of lots of pawpaws. We get more pawpaws every year. And of course, I planted lots of oaks. Now, these are just examples of the things that I, I planted. This is the Bedford oak in uh, Bedford, New York. People argue about whether it's uh, 400 years old or 500 years old. Um, your oaks don't have to be that big before they are productive. Uh, so the oaks that I planted, most of them from acorns, which meant they were free, are now producing things like the, the uh, solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the, the yellow-shouldered slug, the orange-headed epicolema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the, the orange-tufted oneida. The spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the orange-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown buccalatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more have come to the oaks in, in my yard. And it didn't take long. I took this picture last year of an oak that's just popped up above the leaves, about three inches tall. And here's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating that, that oak. Um, this is the crocus geometer. So immediately your oaks will start to serve important roles in your local food web. So this is what my, my yard looks like now um, from the same same place that we took the original picture. And uh, because moths are so important in, in my local food chain, I've made it a, a, a goal to count all the species of moths that occur in our yard. And I'm up to 944 species. We have that many species and I'm not done. I mean, every time we go out, we get, get new species, probably top out around a thousand. But because we have so many species of bird food, we have a lot of birds. There are 55 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. So I know what you're thinking. Um, well, that's 10 acres. Most people don't have 10 acres and it's not going to work in my little suburban yard. Well, let's ask that question. Will it work in a typical suburban yard? Let's go to Margie and, and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. It was there this spring and it's a typical, it's very nice uh, house but uh, it is surrounded by other very nice houses with typical landscapes. What the Terpstras did on their 0.6 acres, so less than one acre, was to get rid of the major invasive plant, which was bush honeysuckle, and put in native plants and also a water feature that they call their, their bubbler. And it's been enormously successful. They've recorded 149 bird species in their yard and 35 warbler species at their, their bubbler. Just in comparison, on our 10 acres, we've recorded eight species. Uh, so uh, you don't need 10 acres. And this 0.6 acres, you can have a lot of life come to your yard. What about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's yard uh, in Chicago. Uh, now, Pam did the same thing. Uh, she pulled out her invasives, planted 60 species of native plants, put in a water feature for her, her birds. Uh, but she only has one tenth of an acre. That is three times smaller than the average US lot. 
And she really does live in the middle of Chicago. She lives one half block from the Chicago's Kennedy Expressway. She's directly adjacent to one of O'Hare's uh, runways. There's absolutely no connectivity with preserved land and, and her property. She's done this in her backyard because she doesn't have a front yard. Her front yard is a cement slab. And she's recorded this an old figure. I think it's up to 113 species of birds, uh, including a woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock yet this spring, you can go to, to Pam's little yard in Chicago and see one. But what about city centers? I mean, now, now this is getting tougher. Well, in 2014, I was looking at this plant. This is, this is what we call butterfly weed, Asclepius tuberosa. And it reminds me every time I say that, that we have a marketing issue with native plants. We call them all weeds, which gives us cultural permission to kill them all. So we're not gonna call it butterfly weed. We're gonna call it Monarch's Delight. Well, I was looking at Monarch's Delight in 2014, and the first thing I saw was two species of megachylid bee. This is one of them. These are leafcutter bees. I know they're leafcutter bees because they carry their pollen on their tummy, and it was sipping nectar from the, the uh, Monarch's Delight. Well, leafcutter bees have very specific requirements, or they're not going to be in, in a particular area. And one of them is they need soft leaves like redbud leaves because they cut the edges out of those leaves, roll them up, and stuff them full of pollen. Uh, and that's how they, they reproduce. Well, there were, there were red bud leaves there. And as a matter of fact, it blooms very early in the spring, providing food for queen bumblebees so that they can start their colony. Lots of other blooming plants there. But then I saw a monarch. I actually saw two monarchs on the, the uh, monarch's delight. Now, this was 2014. In 2013, I had gone the entire year without seeing one monarch. So I was excited. And it was June. Uh, so it, was, it takes a while for the monarchs to get up the East Coast, and we don't usually see them in June. So here are two monarchs up early. This was very exciting. Why were they there? Well, they had monarchs delight. They also had other species of, of milkweed there. They had everything they needed to reproduce. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line. There's monarchs delight. And that is the extent of the plantings up on the High Line in, in New York City. I know many of you have been there. It's a major tourist attraction now. Literally millions of people uh, go there. This is nature in lower Manhattan, um, which convinced me that uh, if, if a few thoughtful plantings um, with, with thoughtful species choices, now not all the plants on the High Line are native, but enough of them are to bring back the life. Uh, and we do that in Manhattan. We can do it. We can do it anywhere. Um, so any any of the land conservancies that uh, are preserving land, ought, this these types of restorations ought to be a snap if they if they do more than simply buy the land, but actually um, actually manage it in productive ways. So what are we talking about? We're, there are four keys to success that um, that we need to discuss, and one of them is in typical landscapes where humans uh, abound, we have too much lawn. We have an area of lawn the size of New England right now. It's over 40 million acres. Uh, and the way we treat our lawn, uh, it's a dead space. Um, so it's not doing any of the, the four things we need to do uh, on, our, on every inch of, of, of uh, well, certainly North America. We need to sequester carbon. We need to manage uh, watersheds. We need to have viable populations of, of uh, pollinators. And we have to have viable food webs. Lawn doesn't do any of that. So, uh, so we need to shrink the lawn. And I suggest we cut it in half. Take the area you have in lawn, cut it in half. And if we do that, if we replant half the area that's in lawn with, with powerful native plants, we can have uh, 20 million acres to work with. And if we do this at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. And it will be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, of course, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. They add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. There are benefits to building a park right at home. Uh, and one of the most important is that you get to develop a personal relationship with the nature around you at your own pace, on your own, your own free time. And you can do it by avoiding crowds. It's free. You can avoid the travel hassles. I am not trying to, to discourage you from going to national parks, but by the way, they're closed right now. Your yard is not closed. 
Um, and here's a really important one. You get to experience the natural world alone. And believe me, that is the best way to experience the natural world. That's how you develop this personal relationship. Right now, our kids are, are you know, we've got nature deficit disorder. They, they don't get any time in nature at all. So we, we put them on a bus. We drive them to a park, uh, all 30 of them with their teachers. They walk around for an hour. Their teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back on the bus, and that's their exposure to nature. Uh, is that better than, than nothing? Yes, it's better than nothing. But are they, are they developing that personal relationship? I don't think so. Uh, they're developing a relationship with 30 other kids and teachers telling them not, not to, to touch anything. But here's, this could be the biggest uh, benefit of all of building homegrown national park. You get to hunt lizards in your yard. And I learned this from my, my daughter, my daughter, my granddaughter, my daughter's daughter, Zoe, um, who sent me this picture describing how she hunts lizards. You get on the ground and you crawl very slowly, but first you have to disguise yourself with sticks and leaves so the lizards don't see you coming. You can wear your best dress, it's okay, as long as you move very carefully. And believe me, Zoe is dead serious about this. And when she grows up, she is gonna remember hunting lizards in her front yard. The lizards she she's hunting are anoles. She lives in Hawaii, where her front yard is about 10 feet by 10 feet. Not very much nature, but it's enough for her to develop that, that personal relationship. And she invented this on her own. By the way, if you have kids or grandkids and you're, you're um, interested in getting them more um, to interact with nature in, in uh, very clever ways, this is a great book just out called Nature Play at Home, Nancy Stranisti. Um, thumb through it. I mean, there are, there are uh, all kinds of things I never thought of doing and uh, keep those kids busy. Okay, first thing, shrink the lawn. The second thing is we need the plants we're going to put in that area that's in lawn um, are what I call keystone plants. They are essential. And what I'm talking about is that our research has shown that, that really just a few, a small percentage of our native plants are creating about 75% of the caterpillar food that drives local food webs. Only about 5% of our native plants are doing that, which means there are a whole lot of native plants that aren't making a whole lot of caterpillars. So um, natives are good, but all natives aren't the same. And we can't leave out that those very high producers. So the question really is no longer simply, are natives better than, than non-natives? On average, they certainly are. Uh, but I really can build a 100% a, uh, native landscape that is um, almost barren because uh, I didn't, if I don't choose those, those keystone plants. So the question really should now be, um, do you want ecologically productive plants in your yard? Um, or do you want ecologically benign or even worse, ecologically destructive plants in your yard? The answer should be, should be obvious. I get uh, emails fairly regularly um, reminding me, they said, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from, from Asia, favorite uh, landscape plant in a lot of places in this country. Don't you know they grew in North America 7 million years ago? So they actually were here. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and, and all will be well. Well, remember, uh, this is not our metric anymore. I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. They support zero species of caterpillars. This is our metric. So you can plant your ginkgo, but this is what it looks like. There's not a bite out of them ever. Um, so they're not gonna support your local food web. And that's, that's got to be part of the criteria we're looking at. Compared to oaks, oaks number one keystone species in 84% of our, our counties. Uh, in the mid-Atlantic states, they support, and that includes New York, they, they support 557 species of caterpillars. 557 species of, of bird food. It's hard to beat that. Let me just give you an example of, of the power of keystone oaks in, in our yard. So, so far I've recorded 944 moth species in, in my yard. And of those 944 species, we know the host plant of 825 of them. So uh, there's a bunch we don't know what they eat, but other ones we do know what they eat. 248 species use oaks. Now we have 59 genera of native woody plants on our property, most of which we put there ourselves. Only one of which is the genus Quercus, the oaks. 
which means oaks represent less than 2% of our woody plant diversity, but they support at least 30% of our moss species and possibly more than that because there's over a hundred species we've collected so far that we don't know what they eat. And I'm sure some of them do eat, eat oaks. That's the power of a keystone plant uh, in your, your local food web. We can't do without them. Point number three, keystone plants work really well unless we have the lights on. And unfortunately, we have the lights on on everywhere. Light pollution, it's turning out as, as people, more and more people study it, uh, is turning out to be a horrendous problem uh, because it kills insects and it kills them in a number of different ways. It kills them through exhaustion, through collisions with burning hot bulbs. It incinerates them. It dehydrates them, increases predation. The bats and everything else come to pick them off around these lights. It blinds insects. Who knew? So even if they survive the exposure to the light, they're blinded. Uh, it misdirects their, their ability to lay eggs and disrupts their circadian rhythms, their foraging, their mating, and, and reproduction. Light pollution is a major cause of insect declines around the world, and we're just starting to, to recognize it. So what do, you, what do you do with your lights? Well, I know everybody says, I have to have my lights on because of security. Okay, put a motion sensor on your, your light. So it only turns on when the bad man comes. And the first thing you will, you will realize is how often the bad man does not come. Another thing you can do is put a yellow bulb in there. They're far, yellow bulbs are far less attractive to, uh, to insects and a yellow LED bulb is the least attractive. Also put a, a shield on it so it directs the light straight down so the flying insects above there are not disturbed. These are all easy fixes. Um, almost overnight in this country, we could reduce light pollution uh, fantastically and literally save many, many, many billions of, of insects. So what are the keystone species uh, in, in most areas in the east? Uh, as I said, oaks, number one. Notice I say native oaks. You can buy uh, an English oak. You can buy a Quercus Sagittarius from, from China. But we have over 90 species of oaks. Why would you do that? And if you do do that, you're going to have a 68% reduction in, in the, the productivity of that, that oak. Same thing with cherries. We've got our beautiful weeping cherries, and I know they're pretty and everything else, but it's the native prunus that are really powerful. The native willows, not weeping willow from, from Babylonia, the native birches. Our natives are far more powerful than our non-natives. Um, and these, so we have... We have uh, Woody plants, we have uh, keystone herbaceous plants as well. Goldenrod is always at the, the top. Uh, we have asters, really important uh, plants, particularly in the fall when the monarchs are migrating. Sunflower is really important, and then, then many others. Where do you find this list? You go to Native Plant Finder at the National Wildlife Federation website. Put in your zip code and the ranked list for the most powerful plants uh, in your county will pop up. These are just the top ones, the, but the entire list will, will pop up. So you know, not knowing which plants to, to put in your yard used to be a good excuse to not do anything. No longer. We do know what to put in your yard now. Okay, the fourth thing we have to do is we have to plant, we have to develop landscapes in ways that allow caterpillars to complete their development. Another thing we're just starting to think about. Here's an example. I live in Chester County, uh, Pennsylvania. And oaks in Chester County, Pennsylvania support 511 species of caterpillars. A few of them complete their development up on the tree, like the polyphemus moth. It eats the leaves, it spins a cocoon, and hangs from the branches, then it emerges as an adult and it does it uh, again. It all happens on the tree. Well, I wish everything did that, but um, most of them don't. 480 species, 94% of them drop from the tree and complete their development either in the ground, they tunnel down uh, in the ground when it's loose enough to do that and pupate under the ground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is under the tree. And you see where I'm going here. There is no leaf litter under the tree and the ground is mowed and so compact that no caterpillar could get, get down there. And this creates an ecological trap. You put in productive plants and that draws in the moths to lay their eggs here. The caterpillars develop and then they all die. Um, so again, another reason why we've got major insect declines, we're not allowing them to complete their development. And of course, the cement landscape is, is uh, even a bigger problem. I am not trying to discourage the use of trees in, in cities. I'm trying to discourage the use of cement as a default landscape. 
Um, that's, that's just laziness and it also wrecks our, our watersheds. This is the typical scenario where we have a tree and, and, and it's growing out of a lawn. Um, I had hoped and maybe we'll still do it to start quantifying caterpillar survivorship in a lawn situation like this, uh, this summer. Uh, we'll see what the university lets us do. But I can guarantee it's going to be higher in a situation like this where you have the tree, then you have a layered landscape. You've got your native azaleas and your ferns and your ground cover. Uh, this is where you can do your, your spring ephemeral gardening. It's a safe site. The caterpillars drop down. Uh, the soil is loose. They can easily tunnel underneath. You won't even know they're there, but they're safe because you're not walking on it. You're not squishing it. You're not mowing it. You're not compacting it. It's also a great place to put your, your uh, ground covers like wild ginger or may apples or, or many, many others. Um, here's another important point. This is, we've learned this from uh, another grad student of mine who's uh, doing a postdoc in Massachusetts right now, Desiree Naranjo. There is room for compromise in our plant choices. And that's, that's a very important point. Desiree studied chickadee reproduction in the suburbs of Washington, DC. So inside the beltway. She put up nest boxes in yards that varied in their percentage of native and non-native plants. So when the landscapes were dominated by non-native plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. The chickadees were smart enough to come. They check it out. Even though there's a nest box there and nest holes are always in short supply, they, they, they recognized that the landscape was not good enough to make enough caterpillars to rear their young. So they didn't even try. If they did try, those nests contain 1.5 fewer eggs. The clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. Uh, the nest produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to do it. You might say, well, those aren't huge differences, but you put all that together in a population growth model and this is what you get as a percentage of the non-native plant biomass in the landscape. So this dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live very long, so you have to make babies to replace those adults. If you reproduce at this level, you have a stable, sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you reproduce uh, at, a, at a rate higher than replacement rate, you have a growing population, but if it's lower than replacement rate, you have a shrinking population. Well, these lines overlap right around here. Uh, so when you have 30% non-native plants, 30% non-native plant biomass in your yard. In other words, you have 70% native plant biomass, particularly if it's those keystone species, um, you can have a sustainable chickadee reproduction or bird, sustainable bird re reproduction in your yard. Uh, so what I like about this is this is the area of compromise. If you absolutely need that crepe myrtle or you need that, that um, if you need that ginkgo, uh, it's okay as long as it doesn't dominate your landscape and you've got at least 70% of, of your, your plant biomass in productive native plants. I think this is really good news because if I said you were not allowed to have any non-native plants, um, my audiences would be very, very small. Uh, people love their, their beautiful non-natives and as long as they're not invasive and they don't dominate the landscape, it's okay. Can we use native plants uh, in formal designs? I got this, this uh, picture in an email not long ago, maybe a month ago or so. Uh, a guy, I'm very bad at keeping track of names. He's managing this landscape. It's a, it's a miniature uh, replication of the gardens at Versailles and he's sneaking in native plants. So here's Joe Pye weed. Uh, and he's, his goal is to replace all these non-natives with, with natives um, and not get caught doing it. Uh, so this, this illustrates uh, a perfect point. Formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants and the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess it's okay over there because they're not native plants over there. Can we get a, a, a native planting in here, maybe a pollinator garden into this, this classic suburban yard uh, without offending anybody? Sure we can. Let's put a little fence around it. That, it, there's formality there. It's beautiful. People walk by and say, hey, that's great. And the, the, the native pollinators certainly like it as well. Here's one without a fence, but it's still, it's, it's manicured, it's, it's under control, and it took out some of the lifeless lawn and turned it into a living place. 
Uh, I don't know if you know Heather Holm. She's written books on pollinators. This is her yard um, before and after. Here's what it looked like before. Here's what it looked like after she took out the cement slab and, and put in some, some native plants. More pictures from her yard. This is a, a fence here. The fence is still there, but look, she cut away some of the yard and put in uh, a lot of, of uh, productive plants. This is how you, you can actually do that. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can. And more and more are doing that. Minnesota has a cost sharing plan throughout the state to encourage homeowners to replace lawn with prairie plants. Doesn't have to be the entire lawn, but even if you replace part of it, they will help you pay for it. There's an island in Florida that's paying its residents to allow burrowing owls, a, a listed species, to burrow in their front yards. And people are signing up for it. It's great because it gives, it it changes the cultural perception. It says, "Hey, this is this is this is something the state favors, and I'm helping an endangered species." And and all of a sudden, the culture says, "This is okay. We're all going to do it because uh, it's got formal approval." Missouri offers a a uh, it's a trade-in. If you remove a calorie pair, they'll give you a, a free replacement tray. And I'll bet it's a native trash, I hope it is. Um, because calorie pairs, one of the worst of our, our invasive and they're still selling them out there like, like crazy. And of course the drier states, here's from California, you get a $2 per square foot uh, rebate if you, for every square foot of lawn you replace with a xeric landscape. Um, so this is for water reasons, but it helps biodiversity just the same. Okay, we've made three missteps in my view, in the early years of conservation. By early years, I mean the last century. And the first is that we've assumed that nature is important. Most people would agree nature is important, but not essential. I was in the Cincinnati Zoo um, before the virus hit and they had this, this wall poster. And it just reminded me of, of the way most people think of nature. We have to save wildlife for future generations. And the implication is we have to save wildlife so our kids can appreciate nature, can enjoy it. In other words, nature's for entertainment. We have to save wildlife for future generations so that we have future generations. Sounds dramatic, but it's true. Okay, second misstep, we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. I mean, we talked about this with Aldo Leopold. By restricting conservation to areas that are, are uh, very lightly or untouched by humans, we've condemned it to failure because those areas are too small these days. They're just not big enough to do the job. David Quammen has a, a really great analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. It's 71 rug fragments, none of which function as a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our, our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests that there are places on planet earth that have no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch has ecological significance, particularly uh, in this day and age when, when we have more humans than the, the uh, earth can sustain. We need ecological productivity everywhere, including our yards. So what we need to do is fill in these no man land here with the plants that are gonna support the life that glues our rug back together again. We're gonna create functional ecosystems by, by making the biological carters and rich enough that, that animals can actually live in between these fragments and they're not fragmented anymore. Our third misstep was to leave earth stewardship to a few specialists. For some reason, we didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every single human being. And I don't know why, because every single human being depends entirely on the quality of earth's ecosystems which means everybody's got the responsibility for good earth stewardship. Very few people do that because very few people know what it is. We don't, we don't teach it in school, but we have to start doing it. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. Uh, we, have all, we have some very serious environmental problems today, uh, like climate change, it's huge, it's gigantic. If I said, please uh, solve climate change tomorrow and, and, and show me the results, you wouldn't be able to do it. 
But you could go out and plant an oak tree tomorrow and we could see the results in just a very few days. A single person can make a difference. And that makes us feel good. It makes us feel like we are contributing. So we do it again and more and more people do it. And that's what makes it work. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire earth's problems. They're, they're pretty big. Just focus on the land you own or if you don't own any land, focus on the nearest park where you, you live, where you can volunteer. I, I guarantee they will be happy to have your help. Do those things we need to do. Get rid of the invasive species, shrink the lawn, put in the keystone plants, put in a pollinator garden. I didn't have chance to talk about that. Uh, but that's it. Those four things, that, that will solve the problem. So as property owners or volunteers, each one of us has the power we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we do so is going to determine nature's fate. What I'm saying here and what my grandchildren are saying to you is you are nature's best hope. Thanks very much. That's fabulous, Doug. Thank you so much. And now uh, on to our questions. And we had a lot of questions that came in. I appreciate that. Um, so we'll try to cover as many of those as we can. And the first one, you just mentioned climate change. Um, one of our questions was, isn't climate change going to make it almost impossible to restore native landscapes? No, just the opposite. Because climate change, climate change has really increased climate variability. We get the extremes. I mean, here we are in May and, and half the country's in a polar vortex. These are extreme weather events. Who's going to weather it the best? It's the plants that have been here forever that have the most amount of genetic variability that are going to weather these types of, of changes. If we start moving things around, that has never worked well in the past. Um, so I would I would put my money with the the uh, native plants uh, and don't. You know, a lot of people talk about assisted migration. Oh, you better bring a plant up from North Carolina because it's going to get too too warm. Um, I don't think that's a good idea because that will that you bring the planet from North Carolina. It's not going to be able to handle the extreme cold that will happen occasionally or maybe even frequently uh, along with those extreme hot, hot weather. So so it'll die. You also will remove it from all of the things that keep that plant in check. All of the the herbivores and diseases that um, that it co-evolved with in North Carolina. So it is best to go with the natives that have always been here. Okay, great. Um, we had a question from Patty in West Seneca. She says, I recently purchased a suburban home. The backyard is a generous size, but has nothing but grass and a couple of arbor vitae. I, I'd like to plant something to make it a bit more natural while offering a visual screen for privacy. The problem, deer. I love to see them, but they eat everything. Do you have any suggestions for deer resistant plants and or natural ways to keep the deer from eating new plantings? There's actually an entire book about deer resistant plants out there. I don't remember the, the title precisely, um, but we have to be careful with that. Deer resistant plants are largely insect resistant plants too. That's building a landscape of inedible plants and that's not our goal. What we really need to do, and I know you as an individual, this is this is tough, is we've got to get the number of deer down so that that doesn't happen. But I have a tremendous deer problem here at home, and we have gotten around it by individually caging plants until they get past uh, the, the point where deer can, can harm them. So we get a five foot galvanized uh, fence and I just make rings, not tiny little rings, let the branches spread out. When I plant that oak as an acorn, it grows up. And then finally I can remove the, the, the fence. I call it graduation day uh, and the trees are on the route. My, my oak trees at this point are, I don't know, they're pushing 40 feet tall. So they do grow. It's a lot faster than you, than you think, but that protects them from, from the deer. There's nothing more frustrating than to nurse a plant along for four or five years and then have a deer uh, chew it down to nothing in, in five minutes or a buck come and, and rub its, its bark raw and kill it that way. So the deer are a tremendous problem, um, but that's the only way that, that I know of uh, that will give you a productive landscape. Now there are plants uh, that, that deer don't like, like uh, spice bush is, is one of them. 
you know, I used to think that things like American holly uh, would, would, not, would be relatively deer resistant, but a hungry deer is going to eat anything. Uh, and our deer are getting hungrier and hungrier the higher we let those populations go. So I would think more about how, how can you get those productive plants into your yard past deer damage rather than just what don't deer eat. Thank you. Um, here's another one. In my small city yard, I worry that if I attract birds to my yard with native plants and a water source, the birds and or their young will just be eaten by my neighbor's cats. Are outdoor cats really a significant problem and what can be done about it? Outdoor cats are a terrible problem. They kill two to three billion birds a year. So you know that three billion we've already lost? Well, that's a third of the bird population. Cats are taking out another third every year. Um, and it's, you know, this is a, this is a very hot button issue. You, you, anytime you talk about it, you get death threats. Seriously, people love their, their cats. Uh, but the solution is for people to keep their cats in, indoors. Your neighbor's cat, your neighbor does not have the right to unleash a predator on your yard to kill all your birds. Um, that's, you know, I'm not trying to encourage uh, lawsuits, but that's an infringement on, on your rights. And at some point, um, I don't know, the solution is to have the cat in, indoors because they, they really do kill your birds. Okay, I appreciate you're willing to tackle difficult <laughs> Questions. So this next one is from um, one of one of our uh, beloved landscape experts around here, native plant experts, Sally Cunningham. Um, she says, especially when the public can't always find pure native plant species, when are nativars at least better than non-natives? Are there some good examples of quite useful nativars? When is the DNA still good enough for a caterpillar or the pollen still good enough for a pollinator? So that's probably a more in-depth question than everybody would understand, but I think it's also an important one. It's, it's the cold of our question. It is the most common question I, I get. And it's a good question mm -hmm. because if you go to the nursery to buy a native plant, chances are very good. It will be a cultivar because the nursery industry uh, thinks that you believe plants are just decorations. And if they don't change uh, the decoration every year, you won't buy an, a new plant. Um, so until we convince the nursery industry that there is a market for plants based on function and not just on aesthetics, uh, there are going to be a lot of cultivars out there. So we did a study looking at six common cultivar traits uh, that had to do with leaves and plant structure, berry size, disease resistance, um, but not flowers. We didn't look at flowers. Uh, and we found out of the six traits, the only trait that actually decreased insect use was taking a, red, a green leaf and making it red or purple. And that's because that introduces anthocyanins into that, that green leaf. And anthocyanins are feeding deterrents. All the other uh, manipulations that we commonly do uh, did not reduce insect use. So, uh, so that was good news. It was a bit surprising, but it was, was good news. Uh, now, Annie White at the University of Vermont has looked at, at what happens when we change flower size, flower shape, flower colors, uh, and the news isn't quite as, as good there because uh, many bees have a very specialized relationship with plants that includes the structure and the color, the pollen nutrition, the nectar uh, quality and amount. And when we start fooling around with uh, the genetics of flowers, we change all that stuff. And we have no idea how it in impacts uh, pollinators. Sometimes it doesn't seem to impact them at all, but sometimes it impacts them totally. Like if you create a double flower, you have, have a blood root, double flower, blood root, beautiful, but there's no pollen and no nectar because you've taken the reproductive parts of the plant and made them petals. Same thing with, with uh, native hydrangeas, hydrangea arborescens, Annabelle. Um, that's most of the the fertile flowers have been turned into bracts. So people say, well, it's a native plant, it's helping the pollinators. No, it's not because you've taken away the pollinator function. Um, so the, the short answer is it depends on what the genetic change was that created the, the cultivar. Um, not all cultivars are, are bad, but um, I would love to see nurseries sell straight species right alongside of the cultivars 
so they can discover that there actually is a growing market for straight species and you as a consumer get to choose. That sounds great. I love this next question. Uh, why should I care if birds are disappearing? I don't even like birds. So I, I know the gym that I go to, I told my trainer one day that I was going birding and she said, what on earth is that? So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, well, you know, what you're really saying is why should I care if nature disappears? And, and you should care if nature disappears because you will too. We are part of nature. We are totally dependent on it. Birds are just you know, they're just one of the things that, that we interact with. But if birds disappear, a lot of other things have disappeared as, as well. So you're, you're, you're really saying, why should I care whether we have eco ecosystem collapse? And, and I think we talked about it in the talk. We need all those, those ecosystem services. And every time you take a species away from an ecosystem, it functions more poorly and produces fewer services. Um, Rachel Carson, you know, had an answer to that. When we have a war against nature, it's a war against ourselves. Uh, so that's just not very smart. So, you know, I might say, um, why should you care if, if uh, we don't have any oxygen? I don't even like oxygen. I mean, it's a ridiculous statement. We all need it. You all need birds too. You need functioning ecosystems. And if you don't like birds, try to learn to tolerate them because they are a necessary part of our lives. Okay. Um, I, I've, I've heard this one a, a few times too. I understand that invasive plants disrupt ecosystems, but are ecosystems really so fragile that a single invasive plant can harm them? Well, if we had a single invasive plant, I'd be really, really happy. But we have more than 3,300 species of plants now considered to be invasive in North America. Uh, so it's not a single, it's a tremendous um, um, pressure on our natural ecosystems. Uh, but you know, there, there, there's, there's some truth to what you're saying there. Is an ecosystem so fragile that it can be disrupted that easily? When it has not been disturbed, the answer is no. Intact ecosystems are highly resilient. They can repel invasions very well. It's the disturbance that, that allows these plants to, to penetrate. The disturbance comes from our logging. It comes from, from hurricanes. I mean, the, the invasives that moved in after Hurricane Katrina, uh, it's a big long list. Uh, but one of the, the most consistent disturbances in um, most parts of the country these days is that overabundance of deer we already talked about. They selectively eat the natives, leave the non-natives, and that pushes the, the competitive balance towards the, the non-natives. And then those plants become highly invasive. So actually, you know, person looking for, for inedible plants, most of our invasive plants are in, inedible to deer, but that's not what we want in, in our yards. Uh, so, so our ecosystems are highly resilient. We have to stop disturbing them and control those external disturbances like deer. Uh, and that will go a long way to, to uh, ending this invasive species problem. So... <clears throat> With an understanding that our goal is to reweave the web of life, what are your thoughts on using pesticides to control something like Phragmites? Um, I don't know what to do about my neighbor's very healthy Phragmites. It's invading my yard and, and I, I'm hearing that pesticides are the only way to kill it for good. If the pesticides are going to kill the very same insects that I want to encourage, then how do you balance those trade-offs? Well, um, you're, you're really, pesticide is a general term. There are, there are two kinds. There are, well, three kinds. There are uh, herbicides. So you're talking about herbicides killing the plants that you want to control. There are insecticides that would kill the insects. So there, there are very few insects. There are only f four or five species of insects that have adapted to Phragmites in the 400 years it's been here, you're not killing very many insects by getting rid of the Phragmites and anything that replaces it will produce more, more insects. Um, you know, I look at, I look at uh, herbicides as chemotherapy. When we moved into our, our property here, it was loaded with invasives and we had huge oriental bittersweet vines. Um, I remember the day we signed the papers, we rushed over to the property, had like a five inch thick vine and I cut it cut it down. It was great to see it coming out of the tree. And I didn't put anything on that root system. It's 20 years later, we are still fighting the babies that come up from that, that uh, root system that I didn't kill. We have to kill the roots. 
herbicide is not the only way to do it. It's certainly the easiest way to do it. I, um, I don't like to spray because you always hit uh, non-targets. So what I do is I cut and I paint. Um, you just paint the uh, cambium layer of what you just cut. It uses very little material uh, and has a good chance of, of killing killing the roots. You can do that with Phragmites. You cut each stem and, and paint the, uh, the area that you cut right down next to the ground. Um, Phragmites is tough to control. So is Japanese knotweed, even with herbicides. Uh, so that's it's just one of the reasons we don't want these invasive species here. As a follow-up question, can you elaborate on any difference between a targeted pesticide use like that to get rid of an invasive species compared to blanket use to create a monoculture in a lush green lawn? I know, you know, we have Canada across the across the Niagara River, and I think um, lawn care use is against the law in Ontario. So yeah, yeah, in Toronto, I heard, um, and that's good. That's certainly moving in the right direction. You know, broad scale use of of, of uh, pesticides of herbicides, it's one of those disturbances that I'm talking about. What would happen if you all of a sudden stopped doing that? Um, the lawn wouldn't persist, but what would come in is a whole bunch of in invasive plants because of the giant disturbance that you've done by removing all the, 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 the uh, native plant community that, that ought to be there. Um, you know, we've, we've invented uh, Roundup Ready corn and soybeans uh, which we, that's what we use pretty much everywhere these days. And that has enabled growers to uh, not only spray their fields, but they spray right up to the road. So that area between the road and the field that used to be weeds, in other words, good native plants like milkweed and, and like the asters that the monarchs need and the 4,000 species of native bees we need. Now that's lawn. They have planted lawn there and they mow it and it looks great and it makes them look like they've got high status, but that has, that has, desertified the entire Midwest where they do that. Um, what area, you know, the Midwest farming communities used to support a lot of life and now it's it's just about lifeless. That's the reason we have a crash of, of monarch pop populations. Uh, but all the other things we're not measuring as well. And that's because of what I, I call the misuse and overuse of, of that uh, pesticide that, um, well, it's Roundup. Um, so it doesn't mean Roundup is inherently bad in all cases. It means that we shouldn't use it when we don't need to. So another question. I live in an area that has lots of Lyme disease, and I've been told to remove the brush pile and keep large lawns in order to reduce my exposure to ticks. So how, I, how can I enhance natural habitats but also be safe from ticks? Aaron, that's just another really, really tough problem. Um, I'm teaching, I'm, I'm speaking from experience because I've had Lyme disease five times and I'm still here. Now I'm lucky because when I get a, a tick, uh, it itches. So I find it. When I get Lyme disease, I get the bullseye. So I find it and I can treat it right away and I respond to the treatment. And I know not everybody is that, that lucky, but I know it's a serious, it's a serious thing. Um, Creating a dead zone every place we have ticks is not an option. It's just not an option. Uh, lawn is a dead zone. If you pave it over, you won't have ticks either. There are very few ticks in the middle of Manhattan uh, because because we, you know, <laughs> there's a life cycle that the tick needs. Uh, it needs rodents and it needs deer, uh, and and you know it can it it does okay on some other other animals, but. What we do at home is we have a uh, we have grass paths, lawn that I mow that allow us to walk through our, our landscape without brushing up against vegetation. Uh, ticks get on you by questing. They crawl up on vegetation. They hold their little arms out, and when you walk by, they they grab on. Um, we also are particularly vigilant at the uh, most infective type time of the year. So these are generalities, but May and June uh, infectivity rates are far higher than the rest of the year. Uh, you can get ticks the rest of the year, but the, the infectivity level of the population is much lower. Uh, but we, are, we, we check ourselves. Uh, it's, it's just another one of those um, things that we didn't used to worry about. When I was growing up, I spent all my time in, in the woods and running around and laying down and, and we didn't get, we got dog ticks, but we never got deer ticks. I didn't know what a deer tick was. Why? We didn't have any deer. 
we had it, we found a deer footprint in my front yard once and we made a plaster cast of it because it was such an exciting event. Never saw the deer. But deer populations were so low that the tick uh, cycle, the life cycle was broken. Now we have uh, way too many deer and that the Lyme disease is, is one of the consequences of that. So, but to answer your question, um, make your paths wide enough so you can walk around without having to, to brush up against vegetation. So um, BD asks a question. She said, your books are make an excellent case for why this is important. Do you have recommendations for more about the how to execute it? Well, are you going to write another book? <laughs> I, I'm an entomologist. You know? <laughs> Actually, I had a visit from a landscape uh, designer early on when I was doing this. And she said, you know, you, you know about ecology, but don't talk about landscape design because you don't know anything about it. And, you know, she's, she's right. So I try not to. Uh, we did write, I wrote a book with Rick Dark called The Living Landscape that um, is filled with pictures, uh, ideas of how you can get more plants in, in a, a layered type of uh, look into your, your yard. So that was our attempt to um, get a how out of me. But you know what, what we, we need? We have a missing, we have a missing, uh, there's a vacant niche that we desperately need to fill. And I call it ecological landscaping so that the average homeowner who right now doesn't do a lot of gardening, they simply hire a, a lawn care service, can simply hire an ecological landscaper. And then they don't have to know how to do it. That person will be trained in how to do it. Um, the design aspects are, are variable. It all depends on, on um, there are certain design principles, but Everybody has a different idea of what, what they want and, and uh, how much vegetation they want. The species you, you need to use uh, and, and the amount of lawn that you should have. I mean, I am making recommendation of things like that, but mm -hmm. um, you're going beyond my skill set. That's okay. The All right. Well, that sounds great. So in closing, I'd like to thank you, Doug, for the work that you do, the books that you write, and for your willingness to share your ideas with us this evening. You can find out more about Doug's work at bringingnature.home.net. Thanks again to the University of Buffalo and Lynn Kamara for your support. And thanks to each one of you for your interest and your time tonight. We're making a recording of this event, so that'll be available. Just watch for an email in the coming days. For more information about the Western New York Land Conservancy's efforts to heed the urgent call to protect wild places, rivers, streams, and working farms, to learn more about how we're developing a ribbon of green in the heart of Buffalo, or our passion for native plants and creating a sustainable planet for the benefit of future generations, please visit our website. It's WNYLC. Perhaps put Doug in the memo line if you reach out to us with support or a question so that we will know how much you valued tonight's presentation. Thank you all so very much. Good night.